Okay. So, um, okay, so back to area. Um, so, I, I, what is, is there anything that seems sort of arbitrary about this idea to you? Is there anything that seems sort of like, why did you do it that way and not some other way? Uh, yeah, Kayla. Um, like, I want to say, why did you do the right endpoint? Yeah, and yeah. Left yeah, why not the left endpoint? But I know there's a reason. There's a reason? Don't remember what it is. Don't remember what it is. That's okay. Okay. So yeah. So it is arbitrary, right? Why do we take the right endpoint? Because we're right handed. Because lots of people are right handed. Right? The left handed people should have should object to this. Think of right. <laughs> right. Um, so there's something arbitrary about this, um, and we'll see, as, as Kayla says, that in certain situations it doesn't matter. Um, Okay, so uh, right now we're going to introduce sort of a more general idea um, where you don't always have to choose the right endpoint. Um, so this notion is called um, so 5.2 Riemann integrals. Or, or first we'll talk about something called Riemann sums. Uh, Riemann is the name of, of a mathematician. Um, okay, so I, I should caution you that, that things are going to be kind of painful for a while. Okay, this class, this lecture in partic particular, is going to be a little bit um, more. Uh, you have to you know, think pretty hard for this lecture, um, but then afterwards it will it will settle down. Okay, so this is sort of like again a local local maximum, and then you know it'll be a little bit easier afterwards. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, so heading towards the integral. Yeah, actually, we should get, we should actually get to the integral, um, today. Okay. So, Here's the idea. Um, you have some function. Okay, again, you have some function on an interval. Okay. So you have some function f on a, b going to r. Okay. Um, uh, you, uh, again, you partition. the interval AB uniformly <coughs> into N, N parts, right? right? So you divide the interval into N, N equal parts, right? And call those points, uh, call all the points X naught, X1, Extend. Okay. And again, uh, let let um, delta x be the width of each one of them. So b minus a over n. And then number three, uh, here's the here's the parts of part that's going to be different. So we you're going to have you're going to have three things: one, your function; two, the partition; and three, you're going to have a choice of points, a choice of points um, s1 through sn. So you have a choice of points where um, each S sub i 
lies in the interval xi minus 1, xi, the, the ith interval. That's the that's the uh, that's the selected point in each interval. Okay, so hold on, hold on one second, and it'll become clear. I hope. Okay, so um, uh, the Riemann sum um, R F <coughs> sub n uh, is defined to be. So the Riemann sum of f uh, of f um, based on choice of points s of n is defined as the sum of f at s of i times delta x as i goes from one to n. And I should probably say the <laughs> That's an R, yeah, just a fancy looking one. Kayla? Oh, this means uh, S of n is defined as the set here. Oh. We're gonna we're gonna call this set choice of points S of n. Okay, so this is you know sort of uh, it looks like a complicated definition, but the idea is simple. Okay, um, you have some function. Um, you've you've chosen some n. Okay, so like say n is three in this picture. I've divided the base into three parts. Um, you, you, for each interval, you choose some, you choose some point where you're going to sample the function. Okay, so let's call, it, let's say this is my s1, this is my s2, and this is my s3. Okay, and then what you do is you take the function and you evaluate it there. You get some height, some height get some height, and you take each of those heights, multiply it by the width of the base, add those things together, and you get a number. That thing is called a Riemann sum. So it's just a random point that you plug in? That's right. So you, you choose, you know, you're, you're allowed to choose any, any point. So the, the right endpoint approximation is a Riemann sum, where, the, where your choice is, I'm always going to choose the right endpoint. I'm always going to choose the right endpoint. Okay. But for a Riemann sum, you're allowed to choose any, 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 whatever point you feel like. Yeah, Noor. So you choose any point, and then you find the height, and then you add the area? That's right. So you, you take that height, you multiply it by the width of the base, right? You get the area of that box, and you add all those areas together, and you get a number. And that number, that sum, is called a Riemann sum. Okay, so that, it's, a, it's just a number, right? Um, And you see, it's, it's what it gives you uh, sort of geometrically is an approximation of this area. Okay. But right, uh, you know, and that, that approximation, you know, is maybe different from the right endpoint approximation. Right? The right endpoint approximation always, always says, I'm always going always to take my right endpoint as my sample point. Right? But for the Riemann guy, you're allowed to, it's, it's, it's up to you. You can choose whatever, whatever sample points you like. Um, okay, so so a Riemann sum is just this thing that it's just a number that you get when you divide the base into equal parts, choose sample points, sample the function at those points, and multiply by the width of the base, and then add those things together. Okay, that's 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 all a Riemann sum is. Let me let me put up some examples 
um, to make it even more concrete. So examples. Um, somebody gives you the sine function. So here's 0 to pi, pi. Um, and says, uh, give, give me, let's take n equal 2. So here's f of x, the sine function. Um, right. We take n equal 2, so we divide the base into two parts. Right. And um, uh, so maybe <coughs> I, I, want, I feel like making a rim on sum. I'm going to take pi over 2 as my first sample point. I'm going to take uh, pi as my second sample point. Okay. Then my Riemann sum, um, <coughs> then f, sorry, sine of pi over 2 times pi plus sine of pi times pi, right, which is uh, 1 times pi plus 0 times pi, namely pi, is a Riemann sum. It's a Riemann sum, and it gives you some approximation of the area. So it's pretty bad. I mean, it's uh, you know, basically it says I'm going to approximate this this area like like this, and I'm going to take zero zero over here. Kayla. Uh, because I divided this interval oh, okay. of length 2 pi into two parts. So each sub-interval is, is length pi. Okay. Does everyone see that yeah, I, I basically made it, made some approximation of, of the area? Right. It's not the right endpoint. What, what would have happened if I took the right endpoint approximation? What, what number would I have gotten? What sum would I have gotten? Isaac. Uh, zero. Zero, right? Because I would say, okay, I'm going to take this as my, my sample point, zero times pi. This is my sample point, zero times pi. So my right end, pro end point approximation would have said the area is zero. Okay. Here, I'm taking some different sample points. You know, I get, I get a Riemann sum, that's, that's pi. Okay. Wait, but what about the other piece? That's negative. Yeah, yeah. So I could have... Um, Right. If I had, if I had um, taken, uh, <coughs> suppose I took, uh, say, this, this is my first sample point, and this as my second sample point. Right. You just pick arbitrary, mm -hmm. but like the answer is zero. you so you'll see how you'll see how it works out. But we have to get there. Okay. okay. So if we took these sample points, then the sum would be, so with these sample points, with this choice, the sum would be, would be negative one, uh, negative one, excuse me. Right, because we get, here we get the negative one times pi, and here we would get zero times pi. Right? So the thing you notice, of course, is that um, the uh, the sum depends considerably on the choice of points. Right? If I choose if I choose different points, I'm going to get a different 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 sum. Um, let me also just throw in two other things that, that um, people might have seen before. Okay, there's something called an upper Riemann sum. Um, and there's also something called a lower Riemann sum. Um, so that, let me just explain in the upper Riemann sum what happens. You, in up, for the upper Riemann sum, you have your you have your interval 
Again, you divide it into the n pieces. And then on every interval, you try to find the highest value. OK, so you, you say, OK, what, what point is going to give me the highest value? OK, in this one, I want to take the right end point. Right? In this one, I want to take the left end point. Right? In this one, I think I want to go over here. In this one, I want to take the right end point. Right? This one, I want to take the right end point. This one, uh, looks like I want to take something in the middle. Right? But you try to find the highest value over that interval and then take all those take all those values and add them together. Okay. So in the upper Riemann sum, uh, uh, choose sample points at the maximum value. Okay. And of course, with the lower Riemann sum, you're going to do it the opposite. Right? You're going to say, I'm going to choose um, the the, lower, <coughs> the lowest value here, the lowest value, the lowest value, the lowest value, and you get you get something that um, so the the upper Riemann sum is guaranteed to give you something that's you know, bigger than the actual area. The lower Riemann sum is guaranteed to give you something that's that's actually lower than the actual area. Everyone, everyone, still with me? Anyone, anyone confused? So nothing, nothing, nothing says it's actually you know, not so not so hard. We're just partitioning the base, choosing choosing sample points, evaluating the function there, multiplying by the widths of the of the subintervals, adding those things together to get some approximation of the area. And these things are all called Riemann sums. Okay, so. Um, one last crazy example, and then we'll um, uh, and then we'll give the the, the definition. Um, so example two. <coughs> Here we have a function <coughs> on zero pi, um, and this function is going to be like this: um, f of x is one if x is rational, and it's zero if x is irrational. Okay. So um, actually, let me make this 0, 1. Just make it so here's the interval 0, 1. And at every rational point, we take the value 1. So at 1, we take the value 1. At a half, we take the value 1. At a third, we take the value 1. At 2 thirds, we take the value 1. At a fourth, we take the value 1. At 2 fourths, 3 fourths, 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 5 fifths, 1 sixth, 2 sixths, 3 sixths, etc., etc. So at every, every rational point, you're going <coughs> to take the value 1. You know, 1 over a million. One millionth, two millionths, three millionths, etc. Those are all rational numbers. One billionth. Every rational point takes the value one. The function takes the value one. And outside of that, the function takes the value zero. Okay. Okay. So it's a very wild, wild function, right? Whenever the input is rational, it says one. Whenever the input is irrational, it says zero. Okay, so now uh, you go into your room, and your friend goes into a room. Okay, and um, your friend uh, says, "I'm going to find the area under this curve. Right? I'm going to find the area under this curve. Um, and so I'm going to uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, you know, I divide it into a, a certain number of parts." And then I'm going to choose my sample points right, and get some approximation of the area. Right? Your friend um, loves rational numbers. Okay. So the sample points that your friend chooses are all rational. Okay. Then what's the, what's the sum going to be? 
what's the what <coughs> what is what is your friend going to get <coughs> as as the approximation of the area? Every point that your friend chooses is um, uh, is is rational. So the sample points are all rational. So what's the height then? One, one. one right? So it's, it's going to be one times this width. It's going to be one times this width. One times this width. One times this width. One times this width. Right? And so your friend comes out, and you know, and and no matter no matter how finely uh, uh, this person uh, div divided it. What 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 area does does he get? One. One, right? Um, right. It's always it's always going to be one. Okay. Now you go into your room and you say, I I don't like rational numbers. I like irrational numbers, right? And what number do you come out with? Zero. Zero, right? And no matter again, even if you divided your base into a million pieces, you're still going to get zero. So you come out and you say, Well, I think the area is zero. No matter what Riemann sum I took, I always got zero. And your friend comes back and says, well, uh, no matter what Riemann sum I took, even when I took really, really fine approximations, right, um, I always got one. I think the area is one, right? OK. And so you see, um, there can be trouble. So that's the, uh, the, the point of this example. There can be trouble. What do people think the area under this under this graph is? What do people think the area under this graph is? Ellen? Mm -hmm. You think it's one? Other people? You think it's zero? Okay. It's not defined. It's not defined. Okay. So um, uh, the answer is, uh, in this class, it's not defined, right? Because there's no, there, uh, well, there's, uh, it, w we'll say that it doesn't make sense to, to ask, ask this question, right? Because, because, um, uh, because the answer depends on your choice, right? Because the answer depends on your choice. If there had been somebody else, uh, sort of, you know, the the mix of you and your friend divided by two, right? Then that person would have come out and said, "Well, in for my intervals, I always chose one rational and one irrational." And that friend would have come out and said, "I think the answer is fit, is is is, uh, is a half, right? Because half of the time you would have gotten gotten ones, and half of the time would have gotten zeros. So th for that person, the answer would have been a half. And in fact, you can get any number between zero and one by 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 going by you know mod modifying your, your how you choose your points, right? Okay." So in this class, the answer is going to the answer is going to be there is no answer to this question. Okay. Now, uh, the actual answer to this question is you have to change your integral entirely and use a different kind of integral. So um, uh, it's called the Lebesgue integral. This thing that we're talking about now is called the Riemann integral. There's actually something else. Um, there's something called the Lebesgue integral. And if you use the the Lebesgue integral. Then it will turn out that um, you. It will turn out basically like this: that that the rational numbers are very very few, and that the irrational numbers are very very dense. Um, uh, not dense; they're both dense, but they're very sort of fat. Um, and so the answer is going to be zero because the irrational guys are going to win out. Okay. So that's that's the real answer, but you're not going to see that until you take a lot more math. Okay. Um, if you if you feel like. It. Yeah. Once I, although once I gave a course that, that that did this sort of stuff, and I got an angry call from a mathematician at Har at Harvey Mudd, like a very senior mathematician at Harvey Mudd. He said, "Why are you teaching a course where they have to get up to page eighty three to define the integral? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, that is to construct the Lebesgue integral actually requires a lot of work, and he thought you know, it was completely useless to do this. Um, but uh, anyway." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's okay. We did it because it was cool. <laughs> that, that's what I should have said to him, but I just said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry that you don't like the course. 
Okay. Um, okay, okay, okay. So here's the definition. No, here's the definition. Um, if the limit of the Riemann sums as m goes to infinity exists um, and is independent, so exists independently of choice of points choice of sample points, then we say f is Riemann integrable. Uh, on AB. And write the integral from A to B of F is that limit. Uh, let's say equals some number L. After where? The bottom. At right? Sorry. Mm -hmm. L is, is this limit here. So if the limit exists and is some number, okay. and that number doesn't depend on how you chose your, chose your sample points, then we say the definite integral is L. Then we say the definite integral is L. So, so this is saying that if you have two, two, two different people and they each go into rooms and they construct Riemann sums and they let the, the partition go to, they let the partition become infinitely fine. Okay, let the lengths of the, of, of the intervals go down to zero. Okay. And they always, whenever they come out, they always have the same number. Whenever they come out, they always have the same number. In that case, your function's a good one. And you can talk about its integral. Its integral is going to be that number. Okay. For us, this is a bad function. It's not integrable, right? Because you could go to, into one room and your friend could go into another. And you come out, I, you say, well, I took the limit as n went to infinity, I got zero. And your friend comes out and says, I got, you know, um, 0.7 or something, right? right? So this is not an integrable function. It doesn't make sense to talk about the, the integral of this function, not in, at least not, not in this course. Okay. okay. So there are some functions for which this, this, will, this is good, this will work out, and those guys are called the integrable functions. Okay. Um, in particular, um, so we're not going to prove this, but I'll just give it to you. Um, any continuous function uh, on some integral is integrable. So whenever you have a continuous function, if you and your friend go into separate rooms and play this game, you're always going to come on and say, I got blah, and your friend will say the same thing. It's always going to end up the same number. Then you can say, and we're talking about the integral. Then, you, then it makes sense to, to talk about the integral. Um, okay. um, let me give you an example of this. Um, remember last time we talked about um, the function x squared 
between two and six. Right? The area, the area under the function x squared between two and six. Right, and we constructed the right endpoint approximation. Right, endpoint approximation. Right, it turned out to be um, the sum of 2 plus 4j over n uh, squared, right? So f of this thing times 4 over n as j went from 1 to n. Right. That was the n, the n right end point approximation. And what we saw was that we saw that the limit as n went to infinity of that of that thing turned out to be 208 over 3. Okay, that's where we where we finished the class. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what if we choose? What if we choose? <coughs> uh, left endpoints. Okay. Suppose we make the left endpoint approximation. Um, if we choose the left endpoints, uh, do, do you see, does anyone see quickly how how this how this thing would change? Right. So this is. Let me put the function in here. Right. We've got these are the right endpoints. You take the function and evaluate them, multiplied by the width of the base. Right. So you get um, two six. Right. Two plus two plus delta x. 2 plus 2 delta x, and so on, so on, so forth. Right. Yeah, Sarah. Oh, did you want? Yeah, I want the left endpoint approximation. So would it be like f of 6, or like sum of n, j equals 1, yeah, uh -huh. and then 6 minus 4j? Oh, yeah. Four j? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you could do it that like that. You could say this is going to be the sum of 6 minus 4j uh, over n quantity squared times 4 over n as j goes from 1 to j goes from 1 to n. Right. That, that's a cool way of doing it. Right. So you're starting from this end and then going backwards. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I guess we don't have time to, time to see it, but um, uh, if you take <coughs> the limit, Maybe we'll do this at the beginning next time. But uh, uh, if we take the limit again, you get 208 over 208 over 3. If you took the left endpoints or the right endpoints, and in fact, if you take any any sample points, you're always going to get 208 over 3. Okay. And so um, um, the way we write that is that the integral from 2 to 6 of x squared is 208 over 3. So that's shorthand. That's the shorthand. That the area under this curve from 2 to 6 um, turns out to be well defined and it always turns out to be this number if you if you play this if you play this game. Yeah, Nora. But didn't you say that it depends on what sample points you get? So But for some functions, it doesn't depend. It doesn't matter. And those functions, we say, are, we call them integrable. Oh. Okay. And, and, and continuous functions turn out to be integral. So, so for, this, for this, no matter what choice of points you make, no matter what choice of points you make, you're always going to get 200 Yeah. I thought we said that it didn't matter for the sine graph. And for the what? For the sine graph. And that's continuous from 
it mattered it mattered for the first two things. So you might disagree in the first two, but as n goes to infinity, you're always going to get the same number. And that number for the sign back will be zero. Yeah. Yeah. And for us, you know, basically continuous functions are going to be our examples of integrable functions. So this is the definition of integrability. We spent the whole class uh, talking about what it means to be integrable, but it's this. That's I, I'm afraid there's no other way to do it. Um, right. So an integrable function is one where you always end up with the same answer after running through this procedure. Okay. You you choose your Riemann sums and let the partition become infinitely fine. No matter what you do, no matter how you choose it, you always end up with the same number. Okay. In that case. We say that the definite integral is that number. Okay. Let me give the, um, the thing that will be useful to you. Uh, so, so what you see, um, so what you see is that it's a pain evaluate the integral. <laughs> right, that's almost the, 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 the moral of this class. Right? It's a pain to evaluate the integral. Okay. But fortunately we have this thing. Fundamental thing of calculus number two. We'll do number one later. Um, <laughs> if f is continuous on a b and uh, then the definite integral of f on a b is just f of b minus capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative of little f. Okay, so yeah, this one that we were just doing, you know, x squared dx. <coughs> you could say, well, let uh, f be x cubed over three. Right? Let x be f cubed over three, then f prime, right, is x squared. So this guy is an antiderivative. So just take f of six minus f of three. You get 216 over, over 3 minus 8 over 3. That's 208 over 3. Okay. Um, if somebody said, what's the integral of 1 over x between 1 and e? You'd say, well, you can either do it by doing Riemann sums, or you can do it by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's use the fundamental theorem of calculus. What's what's an antiderivative of, of one over x? Oh. Ln x, right? So let's take ln. It'll be ln of e minus ln of one, right? That's to say one minus zero. The answer is one. Okay. Or um, somebody says, what's the definite integral between 0 and pi over 3 of secant x tangent x dx. Does anyone know an antiderivative of secant x tangent x? <coughs> <coughs> Those of you who have seen calculus before. Yeah. Uh, no. Secant. Yep. Secant. So you take secant of pi over 3 minus secant Zero, right? Turns out to be two minus one plus one. So you see, you've got this great, great shortcut. Um, and next time, we'll explain why this miracle uh, occurs. <coughs> <coughs>